Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to spend some afternoon time with you. I want to thank you for taking the time out. My name is Christina Russell, and I work with Southern New Hampshire University's Global Education Movement, or more fondly known as GEM. Uh, we work to bring bachelor's degrees to refugees in urban areas and also camp areas. Um, so today, I'm really thrilled to talk with you and also um, give you a taste of how we try to get practical in coaching entrepreneurs and i'm very excited to be a coach at the upcoming mit boot camp in brisbane um, where we would dive even deeper to these type of topics and really help entrepreneurs on their way um, to success so looking forward to that and i hope i'll see some of you there um, as a coach and participant so today um, i'm just going to talk a bit uh, about the story of southern new hampshire university and we're going to do that through the lens of um, how do you sort of move forward and get bigger uh, if you have a non-elite brand um, which is the case with southern new hampshire university and in some cases an unknown brand so i think for those of us who are starting uh, um, and the fields, um, it can be really tough. So I wanna share this story with you of the university more broadly um, and how we went from a place that was in danger of closing down to now the largest online provider for learners, um, nonprofit institution in the US. So we'll go ahead and kind of look through business models together, think about the learning and how that applies um, to the SNHU context. And then at the end, I'll take you on a short adventure um, to our one of our GEM sites and how we're, we're working on that. And throughout this, we'll kind of talk about and think about um, what to do with this conundrum of having an unknown or non-elite brand. Uh, so I'm going to start just sharing my slides with you. So we're just going to talk about the education revolution and how to innovate everywhere. And I think before we even begin with that, there's always a lot of talk about how much our society has changed due to technology. And so, so in known fact, but I think we can sometimes lose track of actually where we started and how we moved. So to warm us up to this idea, I'm just going to start with a video. Um, and you can think about in your own field or where you are an entrepreneur, um, how from 1950 to now has your own field changed? And so we're going to, um, oh, sorry, I don't have us on a slideshow. So we're gonna go ahead um, to Indianapolis in 1950 in the theme of car racing and take a look at 1950 to now to just warm up and think about um, how innovation and technology has changed so many fields. So with that, I will start a video. But Holland comes in for a pit stop. Tom's tire. Lou Moore himself changes the tire. Only crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's a tense time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. are changed at last. A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stopped.
Okay, so watching um, that first uh, section of the video um, is just a reminder of how painfully long some things take, um, but also uh, in the context of higher ed and where we're doing some entrepreneurship, looking and thinking about these kind of, of videos and changes that have happened, we realized that so much of our industry is still in that 1950s mode. And I think for today's topic and thinking about um, brands and elite brands, it's also important to note that that 1950s mode is um, also what has helped elite brands stay and become elite. Um, so I show that video just to encourage you to think about your own fields and um, try to really find and think about, even though we know changes are happening so quickly, uh, the extent to with which in your own area things have changed, or even thinking in your own field of entrepreneurship, in what ways might you be holding on to that 1950s mode of changing, um, changing tires, if that was your business in races. So in terms of higher education, there's not only so many changes happening in the world that higher ed isn't necessarily keeping up with, um, but there's kind of what SNHU thinks of as as a, there's a real need to educate millions more people. Um, even in the video, the first video, there was only high school graduates who could get a good job changing car tires and races. In the second uh, video, there are several engineers, there's an application of artificial intelligence, and so everybody needs to become more educated. Um, there's 35 million adults with some credits. They have no degree or no way to show what they've learned, even if they don't have a degree, and they have a lot of debt. Quality is being questioned by institutions as well as um, folks who are hiring the graduates of institution. And really it's becoming harder and harder to manage access, cost, debt, and the campuses themselves are, are struggling with sustainability. Um, the skills that are often learned aren't connected to the workforce always, and there's just new competition coming into the market. So in this storm environment, there are lesser known brands who are coming into the space and may be able to provide things in a better manner than universities. And I'd argue that if universities don't really start to continue to pay attention to the storm and have some innovation around that, that the newer brands will come in and possibly be able to take over or take pieces of that market, which is already happening. So there's other examples besides uh, just of car racing. We can look at the music industry and where it started. So um, you used to have to uh, buy an album to get one song. You might listen to the same songs across multiple radio stations in any country. And it was tightly controlled and in some ways failing. Um, then we have sort of the storm that started. So if we're in a storm area in higher ed, um, Back in the day, Napster came along, jumbled up this business model, and it became uh, very unknown what was happening in the future of music, a lot of lawsuits. Um, but among some of this music chaos, it really became a time for the elite brands to both have to um, evolve if they wanted to stay alive, but of course for newer and unknown brands to enter into that space. So today we will be thinking about how when these storms brew, they're really a special opportunity for those of us who have lesser known brands or non-elite brands or brand new brands. And of course now um, we have streaming, music is everywhere, we have a lot of different choice around it. But again, it's really that, that story area where those of us with less of a brand have a lot of opportunity, uh, which also can require risk. Same thing with print journalism. So this happened, this change happened so quickly. In 2005, it was the best year for print revenue. Fast forward one year later, 350 papers are going out of business. And even to this day, some would argue that there's not quite a business model there around um, online journalism and how to collect funds around that. So we really looked at these different businesses, whether it be car racing or music or new newspaper and tried to apply it to our own higher ed model. Um, and so we are working in higher ed, but I think um, just sometimes pausing and thinking back through what does learning from other fields mean to apply to your own brand and approach can really help. So the lessons for us um, were that we have a tightly controlled market right now, just like music used to be, and that's probably a problem. There's limited channels right now that are controlled by accreditation and that's going to open up the doors at some point for people to say this model just doesn't work. 
the learning is currently packaged by degree. So once you have a degree, if you wanted to um, get skills in another area, there's not a whole lot of higher ed institutions that are always offering that for either a low price or um, a quick snippet of learning. Higher ed is expensive, as most people know. A lot of employers are really dissatisfied and the business models are increasingly hard to sustain. So we are seeing um, a lot of universities that are having to close down. They just can't run their campuses even though tuition has skyrocketed. So we really asked ourselves, are we poised for a major upheaval and what would this look like? So the first was that we would start to look into competency-based education. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later about how exactly we did that. Um, we do use competency-based education, um, both in the United States and with our refugee populations. The ecosystem is letting in invasive species, right? So at a certain point when not everybody can access the service, when it's too expensive, when employers are saying it's not worth it, uh, that's where you start to see other online players coming into the space, whether that be Khan Academy, whether it be micro credentials. So there's a lot of movement and uncertainty in the um, higher ed and just education tech space generally. And again, this is where it allows for the unknown or newer brands to really um, be able to, you know, kind of take hold and have a chance against those really well-known brands. There's a lot of technology breakthroughs, as we already know. And compared to when online education started, it's now becoming widespread um, and much more accepted. So for us, um, it seemed like there was a big opportunity as a lesser known university to think through some of these changes and how we could position our brand within those changes. <clears throat> So part of what we've done um, is just look at other models, including how they were. The top thing to notice was that new brands, if they could provide something that really um, got into that niche of the problems that higher ed was experiencing, they were able to experience a fair amount of growth. And so right now, given all this growth, um, these are all of the folks that we partner with at Southern New Hampshire University um, who are in this space, right? So it just allows for a proliferation of both very well-known as well as newer brands. Um, and partnership with other brands is also, of course, a way to build your own. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later as well. So I just want to go through a brief history of SNHU, where it started as a very small place and, and sort of our growth um, in the context of thinking about a brand that's not very well known from the beginning. So we started in 1932, very small college in New Hampshire, and we really were training um, accountants to um, go into careers. And now in 2018, um, we're a very large university and we have about 130,000 students. Um, and so I wanna sort of track that journey and how we got to these kinds of numbers. So the growth of SNHU is really um, designed on three different types of models. So the middle one is our traditional people can come to the campus and um, they can, uh, it's still relatively expensive and they can have, you know, dorms and sports and the regular experience. Uh, on the left is our online experience, which is traditional learning in terms of professionals, but it really reduces cost. And we've been able to really support certain segments of the population by uh, specialized coaching and counseling, for example, military populations or single parents. And the one on the right is our newest innovation, College for America. And that's the one that I'll be talking about a little bit more today, both how we were able to formulate it to meet the needs of this storm in higher ed, um, as well as how we bring it to refugee camps. So this big growth um, really happened under the leadership of our president, Paul LeBlanc. And what he was facing when he came on board in 2003 was that probably the university, like many others in the Northeast, that was a small liberal arts college, was going to have to close if there wasn't some major moves. Um, so the brand wasn't super well known, facing some significant financial challenges. And I think in the context of the brand and what our president always says is that 
when you're not the Harvard, when you're not the MIT, um, you are forced to innovate, to stay alive and to move forward. So it's both a challenge to not be known, but it also pushes risk and innovation um, and allows for the creation of new um, innovative products that perhaps would not be the case uh, if we were already elite. Um, because elite institutions are still facing the same problems in higher ed, um, but it can be harder to innovate when you're at the top. So it's both a challenge and opportunity. So this is a heat map of the growth between 2009 and 2016. And what our president did was double down on online education and where it was still newer and a lot of people were questioning the quality. Um, and so it was a big risk and I think he had some hard work with our board to convince them. But what he did was really think about what's the student experience and why don't people have trust in higher ed or what are the challenges to both bring down the cost but also ensure that students were really supported. So during this time frame, a lot of online providers or those who were playing in the space we're just focusing on cost first, and then the student experience second. And what we did was actually raise some of our costs by hiring on advisors and using data analytics that would uh, alert any single advisor to any kind of change in student behavior, whether it be login, whether it be a missed assignment, so that essentially any online learner would receive, not from their professor, not a shaming note or anything like that, but would receive a helpful or encouraging ping from an advisor who would really try to think about some of the social problems or any other challenges in learning. Um, um, and it was through that that the brand really be able to was able to grow um, largely through word of mouth and students completing what they got. As they continue to grow, the university, because it's a nonprofit, so we're, you know, we're, the goal is not to turn a profit, but of course to serve as many students as we can extra funds were then put into advertising to start to spread the name around this kind of unknown brand. So it was really bringing the quality and taking a different approach than other brands and then promoting the brand with any kind of funds that were coming in. Most of you have probably seen an SNHU commercial at this point. Um, so I want to uh, talk a little bit also about College for America because I think it's the most innovative thing that the university is doing um, and a piece of I think what came out of not being known or not being an elite type of institution. Um, and that is through um, College for America. And what we did was try to look at the storm that was happening in higher ed and recognize um, that you know, even though our online model, traditional model was so successful and our campus does well, um, we essentially still weren't fully addressing this storm in higher ed or the fact that it costs too much or that employers aren't always happy with outcomes. And so we looked at some of the data you can see in front of you and we said, you know what? Academics are running higher ed. They're designing all of the curriculum. We need to change this. We need to engage um, all of our all of our um, folks in in different ways, and we need to get um, both the student experience as well as the employer experience on with that. About what can't graduates do, and so some of the elements you see on this on the screen started to become our drivers rather than just academics who yes know and love their their subject and have expertise, but we wanted to bring our learning more towards what employers wanted. And we also kind of looked for a gap in how people were understanding things. So we asked college. Um, sorry, that should say college graduates, um, do they have the necessary skills and competencies to succeed in the workplace? Provosts and presidents, they all think they're ready and business leaders really don't. And so I wanna um, you know, really think about this before I talk a bit more about how we created the competency-based degree. Um, and that point is because it's really essential, I think, when you're not known or if you're like us, that you have a name but you're not well known, um, it's really important to find these contradictions or gaps in understanding in your market. So this is a big one for us. And it told us we really needed to change the way that the degree was developed and what was being assessed by students. 
So to the extent possible, when you find that gap, if you're, um, if what you're working on can address that, the more you can stay focused on that, the better. Um, and I would say that um, sometimes I think those of us who are with new non-elite brands, we try to do what elites, elite brands do plus a new thing. And I think that's really challenging. I think for us, we realized we had to really double down on doing it in a new way. And the hard part about that is that it's very risky. Um, the great part about it is that you can create something that's just not out there yet. Um, so though we don't, um, we don't not like elite brands. We love elite brands, of course. And so what we do is we partner um, with folks who are really experts in the area to bring the brand credibility. Um, so for example, when I started the global education movement as SNHU to bring uh, degrees to refugees, I went to the MIT Solve competition and was able to pitch there. And when we were the recipient of that award, we of course would then link the MIT name as a much more elite name in the market um, to add credibility to us. So it's very not much not an us versus them. It's more how can you collaborate and build credibility to your own project. Um, and doing the exact same as an elite brand, I think, is a tough bet. There are certainly those who have done it. In our experience, there's got to be something new, innovative, or different about what you're doing, because otherwise people will just choose the brand that they know. So our College for America degree is $5,000 per year, and it's no fees. So this was a huge cost reduction in how we were doing things. And the way that we do that is that um, we the the degree cost is mostly in coaching and also assessment, but there's no professor in this model and that really brings down the cost of the degree. So I want to explain a little bit about how this works. I mentioned earlier, we started to look at um, throwing out credit hours, that basically if we talk to employers, it really didn't matter to them how much time people spent in a class, it mattered much more what people could do. So we really wanted to design this around competencies. And then we worked with labor market research, industry experts and academic experts in which we designed projects. And those projects to the degree. So there's no professor, um, there's no final exam. A student logs in, gets a project, and submits that project for assessment. Um, the student must master the project before the student can move on. So that means it may take up to seven or eight times to master the project, and that's fine with us. Um, it's all about what a student can do. So if you already possess skills, you can move forward more quickly. If you need to develop them, it will, of course, take much more time. The um, AA and BA degrees are from Southern New Hampshire University. They're accredited, they're transferable and valuable, just as if somebody had come to our campus. So these are just some more um, explanations of how this works. So the other thing we tried to do, and I think most institutions of higher ed do definitely say that they put students at the center, that's all of our jobs, but we tried to reimagine that a little bit in that we want to hold ourselves accountable for students being able to be employed or promoted and for their employers to tell us that that was actually the case of what happened. So this is sort of the ecosystem around them to support. And we also changed a little bit. Rather than recruiting students directly, we decided to work with businesses. Um, and because of the cost point and because of the way the projects worked and that we were willing to work with businesses to create these project, projects, excuse me, it became a much, uh, a, a sort of new and rich way to bring in new students or in the business model um, component of that would be new customers. So instead of just having students enroll directly, we worked with businesses and we worked with them in bulk to be able to move students forward. So we also changed the channel in which with we um, worked to get students. So these are some of the businesses that we're working with right now. Um, a lot of them you know, have tuition benefits and our cost price point and the flexibility has really um, made this grow across the country. 
So of course, in such a different model, everybody wants to know, does this actually work? Is it as good? It can't be as good. Um, and that also brings me to another piece of branding is that when something new or innovative is happening, it is absolutely essential that you are tracking what's happening so that you can prove that the innovation works. Um, so these are some of our outcomes. Students are still finishing their associates in two years, 98% of them working full time, and 75% um, continue on from term to term, which is much higher than most associate programs. And then we also um, measured students who are attending traditional models. Um, so you can see the results here. Um, this is less about proving something to you uh, on this webinar and much more about just thinking about how you can track and give evidence for your innovations. Um, research can be really, really expensive. So if you're newer or starting up, um, there's also ways to just, you know, track student progress versus um, national data sets or against national, you know, types of companies. So I think it's really essential to have some data that you can show. So customers or whoever your audience is about why they should believe in your brand, why they should trust your brand or your innovation. And so these are also just um, some of the outcomes just from surely interviewing students and collecting up that data. So for the last part of this, before we move on to um, having a bit of a discussion and a, a Q&A about um, you know, your own work and how some of this might apply or things you're thinking about is um, to note that one innovative model then of course can lead forward to more innovation and more brand building. So it, it requires a lot of risk taking, um, but in our case, even though the College for America competency-based degree was really created to address the American problems in higher education, um, we also piloted it in Rwanda um, to to see how well it would work. And the, the results were really outstanding. And following that, we were able to get funding to grow this to four new countries um, and also open an assessment center in Rwanda. So this year, we are um, growing to the new countries and our part of our Series A funding is to reach five proof points and be up for more funding. So this is the project that I'm so proud to lead and um, work on with an incredible team uh, at SNHU as well as our on the ground partners. So we're using the CFA degree that we just walked through to make sure that employment employment is available to refugees. Um, we work in both camps and urban environments and we have a series A funding of about 13 million dollars for the next two years. So next year we will be uh, up for funding again. So um, while our president as he dreamed up um, solving these problems in the US didn't think it would go to the U uh, worldwide, excuse me, um, we've not only been able to do that, we've been able to take it to those tough learning environments that are out there. Um, so I want to just take you out to Rwanda quickly. Um, the video that I'm about to show you is with our partner Kepler on the ground. Um, and there's the video evidence that we use to secure our funding. Um, so I'll go ahead and show that both so you can think about how to try to build a brand when you don't have one yet um, on a low budget, um, as well as just show you a bit more about how this model works. This is going to be our first part of the day. The Kepler model takes the Southern New Hampshire University program and we focus on professional competencies. Before attending Kepler, I was so hopeless because I was thinking, I don't have balance, my grandmother who can me to die, and even the degree that I have in the school, it can't permit you to get even any kind of job. 
in my culture, the women don't go to school because we haven't the courage of study. But the important for me is education because when I get education, I get a job and I support my family and others. We are going to do some games that are going to start fast now in Canada. Now that Southern Hampshire has made it possible for the students to get that college degree, it's going to change their lives. They are getting the professional skills that they will need on the job. Things like having a difficult conversation, managing stress, time management, all those things are not offered at a traditional university in Rwanda. Because I'm a student, I'm able to resolve my own problem, negotiate with people, communicate with them, collaborate with them, which was not my character before coming. Students, they will be able to get jobs outside of the camp and better their lives and also the lives of their loved ones and the family. Hopefully it goes to other refugee camps because, you know, when we think about education, you want every student to succeed, you want every student to do well. So I feel like it's going to be an inspiration for other students and the refugee camps to say that they can. It is hope. The hope that we have is because we now attend classes which will give us international degree, which will permit you to compete anywhere in the world. I used to pray to say a God change our life. For now I pray to to get the university. Okay, so that's the video that we were able to use to get funding. You can probably tell from our um, triangle graphics at the end that we didn't have a whole lot of money in our, our budget to get it done. Um, but still, just putting that brand name and out there was a big priority for us um, to the best of our ability, given the budget that we had. Um, so an interesting thing, even though the university has grown so much in the US to 130,000 learners, so many people may know the brand. Um, it still is not so known to others. Um, it's not necessarily known. And um, when I was pitching to get funding, uh, most of our funders did not know SNHU and it became a challenge to convince them um, that this institution was different and special and worthy of their money um, to be able to grow this program to serve refugees. Um, so I think then, you know, we faced, despite all the, the growth, we still faced a lot of challenges. Um, and we had to really strategize through not being known to our funders. So the first, as I mentioned earlier, was making sure that we presented research so that people knew they were investing in something that had already been tried and could work in some Sort of. Um, the next was investing in a visual. So you can see it's not the most beautiful video ever, um, but we thought about a few things carefully. Um, number one, I was kind of going around and doing a lot of the pitching for funding. And um, people could talk to me easily if they wanted to. Who they couldn't talk to were our beneficiaries. And so we wanted to make sure in that video that it was really um, the instructors and the students we were working with um, who had the voice in what was happening and why it was beneficial. So if you're the one who is always going around and pitching as the leader of whatever you're, you're starting or being a part of that, that team, recommend to build your brand by allowing um, other voices to be heard and taking people to where you're doing something and how you're doing it. It's much more powerful than you pitching and then you in a video also. Um, so that was a, a strategic move that we tried to build the brand and convince funders. 
Um, also, as we talked about earlier, linking with more well-known brands, but ensuring that the link is meaningful. So if you're having meetings with um, people who are at the top of your industry and it's a one-time meeting and suddenly you say they're your supporter, um, I think that's actually not the best way to go. I think a small amount of really careful, um, carefully chosen and actual relationships will make sure you have credibility. Because um, it's very easy for funders or customers or whoever you're trying to persuade um, to tell whether or not you know, these connections are genuine or not. Um, so I would say less is more. Um, I had been meeting and working with MIT, for example, um, for a really long time, but I never sort of listed them as being affiliated with us or supporting or liking our work until I was actually a solver with them. So pick your threshold of what's a meaningful relationship and stick to the small, the meaningful relationships to boost your brand. Um, of course, asking experts in the field to testify to the power of the model. So for us in education, um, that might be Clay Christensen or other worldwide leaders in education in your field. Um, any experts or well-known names that can boost you up is often helpful. And um, you don't have to demonstrate leadership, leadership, just demonstrate leadership. Sorry about that typo. Um, this is really, really essential, right? So you probably already know this if you've been going around and pitching or trying to develop your idea. It's really essential that you can show funders and customers that you know what you're doing, um, that you're fully committed to it, um, and you actually have to build your own brand within where you're working, right? So Southern New Hampshire University was not doing very much with refugees until I was able to bring you know, myself and our team along with that. And so so um, how you portray yourself as a leader is very important, and I would recommend anytime you're talking to anybody, get feedback, especially that critical feedback, so that you understand how different audiences are perceiving you um, as a leader, because in the early stages, you as the leader may be the most important brand um, component. So I want to thank you for listening through this long um, presentation and also just note that we are um, expanding uh, this year. We've already expanded to South Africa, Kenya, Malawi, and um, we're also going to Lebanon next week. And we've opened an assessment center where we're starting to use some artificial intelligence. So um, I'll stop there and would welcome any questions. I have, um, I have a few questions, Christina. Um, so first, let, let's talk about the GEM program. I understand you, say, you shared that you're the founder of the GEM program. Uh, what's the backstory? How did you get involved with the, the GEM program in the first place? Yeah, um, well, I became involved because I had moved to Rwanda um, in 2013 to work as the partner of Southern New Hampshire University in Rwanda. Um, and we actually started in Kigali and we were weren't originally serving refugees, um, but in 2015, we went on a recruiting trip into refugee camps, uh, and it was sort of this moment when I stepped into this very remote camp and couldn't imagine how I would live my own life there or having such a lack of choice, and in that moment, I knew um, I don't know what it's going to be, but we have to do something here, um, and so it was... Um, about a year later when we opened in that first camp and then used that evidence to grow the program. So I no longer work for Kepler. I do work with the university. We still partner with Kepler, um, but I would say an admissions recruiting trip and, and seeing the environment and, and knowing what we could do there was really the impetus for the whole start of this. And, and tell me a little bit more about, you know, how did you manage to get the traction um, you know, actually to get the buy-in to even start a program like this. Um, and then how did you, you know, what sort of, you know, cause, cause in the, um, the, the presentation you just shared, you know, there was, there's a lot of risk taking that you were talking about. And then, of course at the boot camp we talk a lot about, um, not about avoiding risk, but about taking calculated risk. So if you can share a little bit more about how you, you know, um, envision that and shape the program and, and then manage to get that traction in a calculated risk-taking way. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I would say, first of all, I was at a place that supported risk taking. So I'm not sure that a lot of other universities would at the presidential level where we are take the kind of risk that our president does. So the first is whether it's that you're working um, with your board or your management team, um, making sure you've you're aligned with the same level and comfort of risk taking so if i was um, in another institution and always having to push the risk that wouldn't necessarily work so i think your board your executive leadership is really really essential to making sure um, that you're aligned and i think the other piece was that while it was clearly a huge risk um, we did have data to show that this could work at least in rwanda um, and we pitched it to funders as um, wanting to try a pilot. And we also made sure there was alignment with our funder who understood that risk. So the funder who was the IKEA Foundation um, is one of the top supporters of refugees year after year. So um, I'm not sure that we always take the best calculated risks per se. I think for some, we're kind of outside of the realm of what and how they think should work. But I do think the important lesson is that with the leaders, with my team, and with the funders, we're all on the same page of the kind of risks that we're willing to take. And so I think that was a really essential piece as well as, um, you know, in this case, really showcasing the need um, and, and um, really playing into sort of global politics and how things are happening to show you can't not take this risk because the problem is too big and we have to do something about it. But I think risk taking alignment above with you and below you and with funders is a really essential piece of that. Um, and so, you know, you're talking about the collaborative nature and the um, sort of the vision of the president as well as the team. Um, this really speaks about the culture of the organization. Um, and can you share a little bit more about, you know, was that top down, was that bottoms up? How did that work? Sure. Um, do you mean, Andrew, just within SNHU generally? Yeah, and you know, the, not just within SNHU, but you know, I guess the, the nature of the program has to be so collaborative and that you know you need to have a really good team and of course at boot camp we talk about how uh you know and of course this is from one of our instructors bill Olet, who says uh, it's uh, people above product but team above all else and if you if, if you don't have a good team that is aligned in the same direction um it's not going to go anywhere and so part of that is is this core uh fundamental issue of culture you know, I'm sure that, that the culture starts from the top, but it also does come up from the bottom. Maybe you can talk about how there was a matching or alignment, if you will, and how you realized that was, uh, was the right pathway. Yeah, sure. Well, I think a big piece of that is really around feedback. Um, so feedback can be tough to take for you as the leader or myself as the leader when we hear um, something that's what we believe to be well-intentioned or the right move really lands poorly with somebody. Um, we have to collect that data and be able to course correct, I think. So um, that constant open feedback is really important on the team. And then for our team who's partnering with folks um, in each of the locations, we also have to take feedback from the teams of how well we're doing. And most importantly, I think at SNHU, um, th the motto is, you know, that the students are first and is it good for students? So, for example, the university could have a lot more money coming in if they didn't have such a high rate of advisors, for example. But when we look at that, we say, is that good for students? It's not good for students. The success isn't going to be as good. So we're not going to do that. So I think that that culture of continuous feedback is really essential in building that out. Um, and the student feedback is probably the most important piece. Um, but it can be really easy to just get going and be doing a million things, not take the feedback. Um, and I think that is the biggest barrier to collaboration is if you don't understand yourself when you're not being collaborative, even if you're trying. So 
we've done a lot around um, building in feedback systems, um, doing whether it's 360 reviews or questionnaires with our partners or quick focus groups, um, because it's very easy to say, we're collaborative, we're trying to be collaborative, but I think the outside input is really, really essential. Um, and then, of course, it's not business rocket science that who you hire is really, really essential. Um, but I think it's also important to make sure that it's not all crazy risk takers, um, that you have your person who will kind of reel you in and that um, people are coming from different places around the world and have divergent um, viewpoints that can come together with a healthy friction. So, you know, I think, um, I think collaboration can be easy when it's groupthink and everybody's involved. I think where it gets really hard is when you get that friction of different ideas and having a hard time coming to a consensus. And I think for us, it's also been how do we as a group get comfortable with that friction because we're solving so many complex problems. Um, if we don't all agree, we're probably going to come to a better solution. But constantly being on the different end of somebody's viewpoint can be hard. And so we try to um, think through ways to make that friction more comfortable and understand that it leads to a better outcome because that's when collaboration can fall apart is when it feels uncomfortable. Moving on to a um, question from Sophia, um, can you share a little bit more about the challenges you continue to face in, um, you know, scaling this new uh, venture um, with, in education and have these challenges ever been so uh, difficult that they've ever made you think of stopping? Yeah, um, I think I think if you don't feel like at some point that you should stop, you're probably not pushing yourself enough. Now, you don't want to feel that way all the time, right? But you should have a moment where you go to bed and be like, oh my gosh, what I'm doing is this, this can't work. This problem is too big. Um, maybe we shouldn't do this. I think you should have those feelings woven in to know that you're pushing yourself hard enough. That said, I don't think you want to feel that way more than five, maybe max 10% of the time, um, because then maybe you should stop. You can't ignore yourself in that way. Um, but uh, yeah, I think what we're taking on is it's really, it's really bold in that um, refugee camps are... Um, they're hard places to operate. They're hard sometimes in terms of safety. They're hard in terms of opportunity. Um, in Kenya and Malawi where we're working, there's no right to work or even to move for refugees. So we're having to do big pieces of advocacy. Um, students are struggling with um, food insecurity, um, mental, emotional health issues at times from trauma. Um, and Simple things like the internet won't work are really, really tough um, when running an online program. Um, I think the nature of the competency-based degree enables us to come overcome a lot of these challenges because it's not time-bound. So there's no course term, for example. And when a student needs to turn in a project, uh, that student can choose when to turn it in. Now, of course, we have to help and make sure that they're moving forward. But that traditional model of higher ed that isn't working for so many, that innovation from our president that was not planned for refugees was actually so... Um, so great in addressing so many of the problems that we find it can work in camps. Um, so I think, um, gosh, other chance we could name, I mean, operational challenges are always huge. Is there, I, I think one of our biggest barriers to scale is, is there enough space in camps, um, enough computers? How do we get all that piece in? And then on the other end is also the human piece. So how do we make sure that we're training are on the ground facilitators to really help and support students through um, and how do we make sure that that's quality when we're not there, for example. So um, tons of barriers absolutely sometimes feel like, oh my gosh, I don't know if this is doable. Um, feeling that way, I do in the morning say like, okay, we're going to do it. <laughs> wow, um, that's a lot. Um, Moving on, another question from Pedro. Um, he says, congratulations about, uh, on, for this initiative um, and the execution power turning this into reality. Uh, what, um, we well, talked a little bit about the challenges that you face. Um, and of course, SNHU is a nonprofit uh, university, but also um, I guess what he's really asking here is 
how do you continue to remain sustainable? Because I mean, of course, refugees have a very low ability to pay. Um, how does that work? Thanks, Pedro. That's a great question and realized I didn't touch on that in my presentation. So um, the, the goal of our project is that this is at no cost to refugees. So right now it's completely philanthropically driven, but we know that's not a great sustainability model because funders can take a lot of work from the time of you doing the actual work with the people you're serving or your customers. Um, so what we've done to hopefully build in the financial backbone of the project, opened an assessment center in Rwanda. And so I mentioned earlier that the degree is earned completely through projects and those projects are assessed by um, U.S. accreditors, approved, approved by U.S. accreditors staff. And so um, just this year and as a part of our grant, we opened an assessment center in Rwanda. We've hired on 11 people. Um, and the, we can pay staff what a PhD would make um, and cut down by about 60%. So we're creating jobs for refugees and those that we serve while also driving down the cost. So I think you saw earlier that the cost of this degree is $5,000. We believe we can get the delivery cost down to $1,000 by doing the assessment in Rwanda. When we do that, then the 4,000 in royalty fees would then go forward to subsidize refugee learners. Um, so again, this is risky. We're in the new, um, we're in, we, we just actually assessments went live this week. Um, so it will remain to be seen how that works. Uh, the other piece that we're adding on starting in um, January is the artificial assessment piece into uh, assessment. So we're working with a company called Authess and Authess is going to overlay artificial intelligence on top of four of our projects for us to test if we can help people become more efficient in their assessment. So the goal is not to have the technology replace people, but to make them better at their jobs. Um, so there's the financial component. If somebody can assess more in a day, then of course, the more um, we can generate to support refugee scholarships. But what I'm also interested in from the educational point of view is how can artificial intelligence help with assessor bias? So human beings always have bias. Um, that plays into how people are graded. And so it's not only a financial move, but it's something that I hope will help solve the educational problem, which is when a human being assesses something, no matter how well the assessor is trained, um, there's an innate bias in that. And we hope that the predictive analytics around the AI will, will also really help um, make sure that students have a fair experience. So that's our play for the financial component of this. Um, the university right now gives $1 million towards our project each year, as long as we're bringing in funds. And then um, we had raised the rest in this Series A um, part. So the goal is to get more and more away from philanthropy and hope that our assessment center can help us with the sustainability piece. Um, if it doesn't, or if it doesn't work, then we'll of course still be reliant on donors. We don't ever plan on refugees having to pay, um, but uh, we, we hope to move away from that. Next question from Giovanni. He says, um, I would like to learn more about the lessons you've learned by working in a foreign country. Did that help you build this, um, this business, if you will, um, because of these uh, differences in insights? Yeah, um, thanks Giovanni for the question. So uh, I did spend three years in Rwanda working as the partner of the university before joining the university and really trying to grow this. I, know, I think it was absolutely essential for me to do that. Um, I think running something in a different country um, when you either haven't lived or spending significant amounts of time there means that you'll have big cultural missteps that could jeopardize the project. So I'm not saying it's impossible. You can, of course, hire um, local talent on the ground if you're working somewhere else. But for me, the three years that I lived and worked in Rwanda formed the way that I know and understand the work we're doing, spending a lot of time in a refugee camp, understanding people's lives. Um, I'd say a substitute if you can't live in the places you're going to work is to just really spend time with either your customer or your beneficiary and understand their lives. So in our context, that meant 
go to the camp early in the morning and spend one day with a refugee woman from beginning to end and understand what her reality is. Um, next day, spend it with a refugee man and understand what that reality is. So my living and working in Rwanda for three years, I, I learned a lot. Um, um, <laughs> people from the United States are not so culturally a appeasing to others outside of the US always. So that was a very important lesson of how to kind of like tone that down or if I can't tone it down, at least acknowledge that I'm aware. Um, I think working in Africa, um, neo-colonialism and all of those things, you know, you've got to really dig in and think through that. How do you want to frame yourself around that and be able to answer those very, very valid questions people have. Um, Giovanni, I think where it's hard for me right now as we planning into four new countries, and I do worry that I might be over assigning my experience in Rwanda to that. Um, and our funders kind of demanded that we're opening at this pace, and, and we, we want to also, even if they weren't, we want to really get this out to people. Um, but it's been interesting to work in the places where I haven't lived before. Um, and I know I have some pretty big gaps in my understanding. So I do try to work with those just understand people's lives to the extent possible, but I certainly still have some pretty big um, gaps in the places where we're operating. And if I may add, Christina, that's really uh, one of the core uh, learning steps that we teach at the, uh, and you actually get to practice at a, at a bootcamp program, which is primary market research. You have to live and walk in the shoes of build and solve problems for. Um, and Christina, that's uh, fascinating that you have shared that, uh, you know, that you actually did that. Um, moving on to the next question from Yosuke. He says, what do you think about the most important thing in terms of um, making a good innovation? Um, how do you know if it's, uh, it's good in some way of, of what that innovation is? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I don't know if I know the full answer to that, but I will try. Um, I think it's two things. The first for us was sort of um, mapping this storm in higher ed, as we call it in this presentation. Um, if you're not working in education or wherever your market is sort of um, looking at something as basic as how are they changing car tires in a race and just trying to map your own field to how much have, has your business changed or how much have you changed within that? And what are the problems that people are facing with all of those changes? So for us, it was really finding that gap. And a key one for us was that all the college provosts thought that the students were completely prepared and almost none of the employers did. And so for us, that helped us really think about let's not have academics design this degree. It sounds crazy because it's higher ed, right? But we're gonna have academic involvement and we have to, to ensure quality. But let's really bring this to employers. Um, so that wasn't our own innovation idea per se. It was more just really looking at the landscape of what was happening and saying, how can we address that? So I think that's the, not just that it's your own idea because you're brilliant, but because it's actually fulfilling some sort of need or gap, and I think the second piece is talk to where you want, talk to the people where you want to be and ask them, is this valuable? So because an American degree is, val is valuable to me, doesn't mean it's valuable in a refugee camp. Um, it doesn't mean it's valuable in each and every country that we might want to go to. So an essential piece for us was let's go and talk to the places of where and how we want to be and understand um, our innovation, which we think is so great, do other people agree with us? And so it's kind of on the back end of understanding what's happening and then really talking to people. And, and I think, again, I can't emphasize enough the feedback piece. Um, it's hard to take hard, tell you no, that's not a good idea, but that's actually where it's in and kind of refining or rethinking your innovation might come from. Well, Christina, I wanna thank you for taking this time to share the innovative work that you're doing at SNHU. Um, this has been um, a really insightful time. Uh, we have a, a really long list of questions that we weren't able to get to. Would it be okay to have them uh, reach out to you um, for, for that? So, so if that's okay with you, um, we'll, we'll share your SNHU email with them. Um, again, thank you for your time. This has been so insightful.
Um, and until the next one, we'll, we'll see you in Brisbane. Great. Thanks, Andrew. I hope I'll see some of you also in Brisbane. I'm really looking forward. Bye now. All right. Bye-bye.